Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to talk about two topics. Um, first, I'm going to explain uh, something about the technical architecture of the Stuxnet malware and how the attack actually is structured. And second, I'm going to give you some thoughts about the implications as I see it um, and why I believe that this really changes the landscape and makes some significant changes in doctrine and policy mandatory. So during the first half of my talk, I'm, I'll give you some details that we discovered by reverse engineering the code. Like any modern piece of malware, Stuxnet is structured in two distinct pieces, which we usually refer to as the dropper and the payload. In a nutshell, this is just like a missile, where you have a warhead and you have the, the missile part, which is used only for transportation, just getting uh, the payload or the warhead on target. Uh, the, the strange thing uh, in respect to Stuxnet is that only the, the dropper is running on Windows computer systems. Um, but um, the payload, so the actual destructive routines, is not. It's, uh, it's going to controllers. And uh, this is a fact that uh, presented the, the antivirus companies last year with quite some problems because they were just not able to understand what the purpose of this malware was. And that's easy to explain because actually on, on Windows PC it doesn't do any damage. So Windows is just used as a means of spreading. There, there is no actual damage being done on a Windows system. No data is manipulated, no data is exfiltrated, and all the, um, the destructive stuff is actually going on on controllers. <clears throat> Um, another interesting fact is that uh, while the, the dropper infects any Windows PC in the proximity and is uh, quite complex, what we, the code that we see on the controllers um, actually is dropped only on one specific target in the world. And compared to the dropper, if you, if you ever had heard that, um, yeah, the dropper of, of Stuxnet, that's quite complex with four zero-day exploits, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, compared to this, the, um, the payload actually is rocket science. It's much more advanced than what we see on uh, the Windows side because what, what you see there, but well, most of all, has been known already. So, for example, zero-day vulnerabilities are not new. We know them uh, for a couple of years now. What we see on the controllers is absolutely new. We've never seen anything like that before. And uh, so one other thing, as I said, it is dropped, the, the destructive routines are dropped only on one specific target in the world. When we discovered this in our lab, we certainly thought, yeah, that must be some kind of target. If, if you develop the, the most complex piece of malware in the world just to hit one target, that must be a pretty significant target. And yeah, it turned out it is. Um, to explain how the, the destructive sequence works, I, I have to, to tell you something about what a controller is. Basically, it's, it's not a computer. So you can see it, for example, just by looking at a controller. In a nutshell, it looks like a dumb gray box. It doesn't have a screen, it doesn't have a keyboard, um, it doesn't have the Windows operating system, it doesn't have a hard disk, it not necessarily it does have a, a network connection. So it's, it's pretty much unsuspicious. What it does is it controls physical processes in real time. And uh, it, it does this by being hardwired to machinery such as pumps, valves, etc. And uh, one big difference uh, to computer systems is that on controllers you don't find any IT security as you know it from your uh, notebook that you carry with you. So for example, uh, you won't find authentication on authorization. You won't find any virus products on a controller. Uh, you won't find security patches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this is, might seem strange to you, but actually this is how it is. 
So you should consider that the notebook you're carrying with you is actually has a better security level than, for example, uh, the controllers you would find in your power plant or even the controllers you find on, on a Navy warship uh, that are in charge of, um, of uh, manipulating the, uh, the big electrical systems. And, and in a way, this is probably uh, surprising and, and hopefully freaking. Um, one other thing that's important to understand is that these controllers are general purpose. So when I'm going to explain the, uh, the attack routines against the centrifuges, don't think that this particular product that has been used would only be found um, in uranium enrichment facilities, for example. That's not true. You would find the very same products, for example, in building automation to, to run elevators. Uh, you would find the very same products in military installations. Basically, there are only a couple of vendors on the globe. Some, it, it's uh, probably five to six big vendors who do the stuff, and their products are um, general purpose. Here is a little bit more detailed view of, of uh, what a controller looks like schematically. The big difference to a computer system is this right here. So a controller is electrically connected to what we call inputs and outputs or sensors and actuators. Sensors that would be, for example, thermometers or RPM uh, readers, um, and the actuators could be pumps, valves, uh, drives, etc. And in usual, in, in, in the average operation, this controller runs a program right here, and that's executed autonomously. So it's completely standalone in regular operation. We don't need IT for regular operation. At many controller installations, you actually don't have any Windows PCs or Linux PCs connected to these systems. They are um, designed to run autonomously. <clears throat> so over to the left here in gray is the IT side. It's, it's in gray by purpose just to um, give you an idea that this is actually non-essential. This is not needed. The important stuff goes on here. So there is a program executed in here, standalone, and it reads the sensor values, and based on these values, it manipulates the outputs, which in turn uh, results in, for example, uh, specific um, drives uh, rotating at, at specific speeds, etc., or uh, certain valves open or close at a specific point in time. Um, we need the IT side over here basically for two distinct uh, situations. First of all, we needed to configure the controller. At some point in time, the program that runs here must be loaded onto the controller. Uh, so we need some kind of configuration. And for many years, this is now uh, done via Windows PCs. Actually, these are regular notebooks that run uh, the vendor's engineering software. So from here, you load the program um, and you load configuration data. When, when you're finished, you can disconnect this computer and this runs standalone. The other situation where you do find IT in such an installation is for um, uh, operators being able to monitor the process and probably make some parameter changes. So for example, input new um, uh, target values, new set points, and uh, if that is required, uh, you, you have a software application connected here, which is usually referred to as SCADA. In Stuxnet's case, the infiltration and the compromise of the controller took part exploiting this connection. So it was mostly done via the the engineering software, uh, which was used as, as a vehicle uh, to infiltrate the controller. As I said, it's, it only happens for one specific controller configuration in the world. So it's, it's extremely specific. Um, the major 
attack vector that, that you have already seen before is, uh, has the purpose of injecting rogue code onto the controller. So um, let's have a look at, at this right here. The, down here you find the IT side. So in, within these dashed box, uh, there are your IT systems. Here is your controller and here is the physical process that is controlled. Um, the attack has been um, administered by compromising or by hijacking the driver DLL that both the SCADA product and the engineering software or configuration tool of the vendor in question use. They share one driver DLL and uh, they, they both talk to the controller using this very same DLL. What the attackers did is they just hijacked this DLL by inserting, or by first by renaming this legitimate DLL to a new name, and then putting a rogue DLL in place using the original name. Very simple, very straightforward. Everybody could do that at home. Um, so they, they were then able to, when for example, the maintenance engineer loads a new configuration to the controller to inject malicious code into that load, which ends up right here. So here is your injected code. It runs on the controller, and it runs in parallel to the legitimate code that is, is still executing on that controller. And it's only activated at specific points in time. So it's, it's very, very stealthy. Um, important to understand is that this is not an attack to manipulate data, to erase data, to exfiltrate data, not at all. The goal of the attack doesn't have anything to do with data or information. The goal of the attack is to do the damage here at the physical process. And this sets it apart from IT security as you know it. So in control system security, we are not very much concerned about data and information. We are concerned uh, about making sure that, that things don't blow up. Um, because as I said, a controller has direct, a direct interface uh, to electrical equipment, which is driven probably by, by high energy. And if you mess with that, you can uh, do some very nasty things, uh, such as uh, disrupting uh, electrical power for systems or just blowing up uh, a chemical facility, for example. <clears throat> this is actually a classical man-in-the-middle scenario where row code is in, in, in inserted between two components of the legitimate application. <clears throat> The code that got injected, um, you can see a sample right here. Uh, this is um, not assembly code. This is actually the, the code that is executed on, on these controllers. And even if it looks like assembly code, it, it is not. Um, and we were surprised uh, to, to see that the raw code that goes onto the controllers actually contains about 15,000 lines of code. When we started the analysis, we thought, well, that would probably be 50 lines of codes, 100. You can actually do a lot of damage with 50 lines of codes on a controller. But anyways, as I said, we ended up with around about 15,000 lines of code. You see a sample here. Actually, that's, this is pretty significant, as all you can see. We were able to, to understand the step seven programming language. And uh, this, code is structured in two different attack modules that, that go on different controller types using different controller configurations. It is developed by top experts, and by saying top experts, I'm not talking about, let's say, uh, the 100 best um, people the, uh, that the US Cyber Command would have, probably. I'm talking about perhaps five or six of the very best people in the world. And uh, these are not hackers. These are very seasoned engineers. They, 
they took care, for example, about reliability. They really invested a lot of energy and intelligence uh, uh, to make that work in, in a very reliable manner. And one thing that's important to understand in respect to the impact that I'm going to talk about later is that contrary to what you might have heard is not all of this attack code is target specific. So you might have heard that, well, uh, Stuxnet, okay, uh, is about blowing up centrifuges in the TANs, uh, so we don't have to worry about it because we are not in the TANs, we don't operate uranium enrichment gas centrifuges, we operate, for example, a warship or we operate a power plant or a cookie factory. Um, but the problem is, it's not so easy, it's a little bit more complicated because, as you will see, you all know that the dropper is highly structured, has different modules for zero-day exploits, the um, stolen certificates, etc., etc., and the same is true for the payload. So we have different modules in the payload, and not all modules are target-specific. Some of them are generic, and, and these are the parts that, that um, are the biggest problem in terms of future impact. Let me try to explain to you one of, of these um, generic modules that we see in the attack on the controllers. This is a system function intercept. Again, uh, this is a symbol for a compromised controller with the sensors, sensors and actuators over here to the right. And uh, here is the legitimate code that's executing on this controller. Rogue code is here. And what the attackers did in, in this particular sub-module is they hooked a system function of the controller. It doesn't really have an operating system, but it is similar to an operating system. And they just replaced the original system function implementation by their own implementation. Funny thing is that this is actually very easy to do on these products, uh, but very few people knew that this would work. The attackers figured that out. And uh, this would be another example for a man in the middle attack. In, in this case, uh, the hijacked function is reading sensor values from a field bus system. And in this case, it is used, this hook is used so that the row code can learn about the configuration in order to further in the attack just do some manipulations here that makes sure um, that uh, things are going to run wild. Um, here is another example of a generic attack module within uh, the, the malicious controller code. Again, you have the, the I.O. here on this side, and here is the controller code. And, and this is kind of bizarre and, and freaking, because what we see here is, is not, it's not very easy to understand. Um, I have to, to go a little bit into detail here. What the attackers did is they managed to go between electrical I.O. and what we call the process image of the I.O. Um, on a controller, you always operate on the process image. This is comparable to a driver, for example, on your computer, where you don't actually access the physical registers of the hardware, but you access the, the driver's buffers. This is how it, also, how, how it is also done on a controller. But what you can do is by using a legitimate configuration change on these controllers is you can say, okay, no, I, I don't want automatic updates of the process image done by the operating system uh, from the electrical I.O. I just turn that off. And if you do this, you have the opportunity to actually do another man in the middle right here. You're beginning to understand these, these guys really love man in the middle. It's, it's their central paradigm of, of how to do it. Um, if you do this, um, so you can intercept the sensor readings and um, provide the legitimate program code, which still runs here with fake input data. 
anything that the legitimate output, uh, program tries to change in respect to the outputs, yeah, it's not passed through. And the legitimate program code doesn't recognize. So it's, it's completely stealthy. And in, in the meantime, uh, as I said, this, this green program code here is provided with fake input. As a matter of fact, in the case of Stuxnet, it is coded in a way that the fake input data is actually pre-recorded from the actual uh, process values. It's, it's just like you have seen it in the movies, like Ocean's Eleven, etc. And during the heist, um, the observation cameras are fed with uh, fake uh, video footage, so that the legitimate program doesn't know what, what's, or the guards are not, not noticing what's, what's going on. It, uh, important to understand is here that this is not to fool operators. But it does fool operators, but what's more significant is that any safety logic you might have here is disabled. Safety systems are an extremely attractive target when you intend to blow up things because safety systems make sure that when um, sensor readings exceed certain thresholds, then that the, uh, the process is automatically shut down in a, in a safe manner. And this is actually disabled by this particular attack. Extremely aggressive, and as I said, this is generic. It has nothing to do with uranium enrichment as such. <clears throat> so let's go to the target-specific code, which is still there in other modules. As I said, it's, it's around about 50,000 lines of code, so we have lots of stuff where the attackers are doing their thing. And uh, what we discovered is that the configuration of these attack modules match the Natanz fuel enrichment plant 100%. Um, what gives us a very high confidence about the target is that if you remember, I, I said that a couple of minutes earlier, um, the attack, these 15,000 lines of code are actually um, divided in, in two modules that, that tar target different controller models. And what gives us a very high confidence that this is about Natanz and Natanz only is the fact that both modules or controller models which are affected match the configuration that we see in Natanz. And uh, another confirmation is um, that Iran admitted, yeah, uh, our centrifuges in the TANs have been attacked by, uh, by Stuxnet. And this is also supported by reports from the IAEA. So we, are, we have, let's say, 99.95 confidence that the whole attack is about the TANs and about the TANs only in an effort to delay the Iranian nuclear program. Um, if you go into, uh, look into detail in how this um, attack is designed in, in this uh, target-specific modules, what we see is, yeah, it, it's about damaging the centrifuges. But what you see here is actually uh, an IR2 centrifuge split up into pieces. It's not an IR1, it's, it's a, the successor. And the, um, the attack vector is aiming at destroying the rotors, the, this, this black object that you see here on the table but beneath the, the Iranian president. And this is the moving part within the centrifuge. If you uh, manipulate the RPMs long enough, then you're able to, to mechanically crack the rotor. And if, if the centrifuge is loaded with uranium hexafluoride, then it might actually explode. Um, what we also see is that the attackers did not attempt to hit as many centrifuges as soon as possible. So in, just in, in hit and run matter, manner. But just the other way around, it is, the, the attack is designed very stealthy. It is obviously, it was obviously planned to continue for many years. 
So the idea might have been, okay, they are losing a couple of hundred centrifuges. They are used to seeing a centrifuge explode because the design that, that Iran is using on the R1 is, is very unreliable, very old. It's basically German design from the, from the 60s um, that they acquired by AQ Khan. Um, so it, they are used to seeing a centrifuge explode. And the attackers might have thought, okay, they won't recognize they're under cyber attack. And uh, if they replace a couple of hundred centrifuges, okay, a month later, we destroy the next. So again, the effort was to delay the Iranian nuclear program for uh, several years. Um, what we see from, from code analysis is that the attackers had very good intelligence on um, the configuration and, and about uh, the technical details. Uh, they had access to malware developers. They um, uh, had uh, controller crackers on their team. Um, they um, have experts uh, who are familiar with the IR1. They also ha must have had an IR1 test bed. And um, they obviously have um, an infrastructure for covert operations. Uh, so this is a covert operation. And uh, so not more, but, but it, it was until last year. Um, here is, is a breakdown of the exploits that have been used. And uh, in, in over at, at the left, at the top left, you see the stuff that's uh, going on at the, uh, on the Windows PCs. And then you see exploits that are related to um, the applications, uh, the IT applications, as I said, the SCADA application and the engineering software. There we also see exploits. Then we have the exploits at the controller system level. And finally, we got um, the application level code that actually is designed to crack the rotors. Funny thing is that, again, when you look at the, uh, I have attached some, some symbolic dollar figures here, like we would see it in, in uh, restaurant uh, guides or, or hotel guides. And uh, so uh, if you think, well, the, the zero-day vulnerabilities, yeah, they, they are very expensive. Where compared to what we see here, that's nothing. That's a piece of cake. And just for the simple reason, because if, if you want to do this, you need much more assets. So, for example, to do this, you need uh, uh, intelligence on top secret military um, details. And uh, uh, to do this, you need, as I said, the best of the best in, in controller cracking. Um, so now let's, let's step back from the technical details and let's try to think about what that means. Um, first of all, I would like to start off and give you my definition of cyber warfare. I, I, I haven't been able to, to attend yesterday, so if you have already discussed definitions on cyber warfare, I, I don't know. i just give you mine. I think a good definition would be to define cyber warfare as a malicious manipulation of cyber systems supporting or substituting a conventional act of war, where the impact that you're achieving or trying to achieve is equivalent to a conventional attack. Um, this means, for example, that, that we exclude cyber espionage. If you include cyber espionage, you would be under, uh, you, you would experience cyber war all the time because cyber espionage is going on all the time. And I think it, it makes sense to separate this from cyber war. Um, in this definition, I use the term cyber systems, a malicious manipulation of cyber systems. And the important thing to understand is what, what a cyber system would be. Most of you might think, yeah, th that's easy, that's computers. Actually, it's much more. So, for example, smartphones are certainly cyber systems, ADMs are cyber systems. Um, then we have home entertainment, think about the Sony issue that was going on um, recently. And then we have a very large bubble over here, and that's control systems. And as I said, they are not computers. Um, they are used, for example, in building automation, factory automation. They, they are used in military weapon systems. Every system where big objects are moving more or less automatically, and probably just firing a missile or something like that, there you find controllers, and certainly also in critical infrastructure. Uh, we can even divide this big bubble further. This is what, what I'm doing right here. So, for example, we find SCADA systems right here. 
it's important to understand that SCADA really is only a small sub-bubble. When we talk about SCADA, we are referring to um, IT software that enables human operators to monitor a process and to uh, do some process adjustments like starting and stopping the process. That's SCADA period. But in, um, there are a lot of more systems within this big bubble, such as distributed control systems. Then we, have, we got some very large sub bubble that's PLCs or programmable logic controllers. Uh, we got a very important bubble that's safety instrumented systems. As I said, when you want to really strike hard, and you want to create a dramatic effect with explosions and fireworks, uh, you would be looking at safety systems. Um, then we have, th these are also very interesting, uh, we have programmable protective relays. These are good when we want to try to attack power stations, for example, because there you find these relays, they are programmable, they are network accessible, and they are very easy to compromise. Uh, we got RTUs and uh, we got low-level stuff like bus captors. So it's, it's a universe of small systems, um, which are basically, most of them are real-time, and they offer zero protection, zero security. And anything I do there enables me to create an effect outside of the cyber space, which is what your attacker is probably trying to achieve. So if, if, if you say as an attacker, well, why mess with data if I can just uh, disable military weapon system? So, yeah. so if you want to do that, you have to leave cyberspace and, and you could pick any of, of these subsystems here. Um, so good targets for attacks like these would be found, for example, um, at military facilities and weapon systems, critical infrastructure and critical industries. I'm referring to critical industries to specific industry sectors which have um, a significant, which play a significant role for a nation's um, economical um, standing. So for example, in Germany, if you would attack the automotive industry, this would have a dramatic effect uh, on Germany's economy. Uh, certainly, it, this, this could easily be much higher as the effects that we saw uh, from the financial crisis. And uh, one thing, uh, probably for, for those of, of you who are studying cyber warfare uh, in theory, one thing is, is noteworthy. I believe that uh, Stuxnet is, is changing the landscape in, in a, in, in, in certain ways because many things we thought about cyber warfare earlier just were proven wrong. Uh, so for example, it was thought that for cyber warfare the internet would be a major factor. Um, it was uh, most of the scenarios that, that have been discussed were symmetrical. So it, it was for, for example USA against China, um, it, involving war game dialogue scenarios where China uh, takes down a power plant and the United States takes down uh, uh, air traffic control in China and, and, and then they are doing some kind of a ping pong game. Um, then uh, there was also the notion that this, these scenarios given that cyber war would probably be uh, strategical and um, uh, that it would be a good idea to defend by deterrence. Now, after Stuxnet, we, we were able to say that many of these assumptions uh, really are a little bit unrealistic because what we have seen is that uh, in, in, when you do some, want to do something like Stuxnet, the internet really is not a major factor. When you're going at, at interesting, significant targets that are not connected to the internet. So, for example, uh, the, the target that I have been talking about, the Natanzer uranium enrichment plant, is probably one of the best protected um, military sites in the world because Iran knows that they're very high on the list uh, of, uh, for example, the United States military. So they certainly don't have an internet connection. Um, what we also see um, that uh, this is useful for asymmetrical conflicts. Uh, certainly, Iran is unable to retaliate with cyber means. They can't. They just don't have the capability. And um, it is also not a dialogue interaction where 
all of the, let's say, 1,000 um, US soldiers from Cybercom sitting at their lab books. I think all of you have seen video, or pictures like this. And, and they're just doing their, their stuff online in dialogue, and, and they're fighting against their Chinese or, or Russian opponents. Uh, so it, it really didn't work like this. What we have seen here is the first use of a cyber weapon. And I, I will go on, I'm going to explain what I mean by this. Uh, in a way, it's, it's fire and forget. So you plant your, your weapon using uh, a dropper, as I have illustrated. And um, that certainly, you need a little bit of luck, as in any military operation. Let's be honest here. And uh, yeah, the attackers in, in Stuxnet case, they, they were lucky. Yeah, they, they managed to get their warheads on target. And then it executed autonom autonomously. So no online interaction required. It's fire and forget. And so, for example, if, if you might have heard that, yeah, Stuxnet deletes itself in 2012, et cetera, et cetera, this only applies to the dropper. The payload is never deleted. So it would still be on these Iranian controllers if, if uh, Iran wouldn't have cleaned the controllers up already, which they obviously did. And, uh, this type of warfare is also tactical rather than strategical. It was a, a technical use of a cyber weapon. And um, finally, deterrence won't work. I, I hope, I wish that we are going to discuss this afterwards in the Q&A. In, in a technical way and, and, uh, and, and scenario like, you could say, just forget about deterrence. It won't work. Um, so here is my definition of cyber weapon, a software artifact with destructive potential designed for deployment in cyber conflict. And I think this, is, uh, this, this makes sense to, to distinguish it from a cyber attack, because a cyber weapon actually is an artifact. So for example, I can download it from the internet if it's available in the internet, like in the case of Stuxnet, and I can analyze it and I can deploy it to my opponents, on my opponent's systems, and it does its thing. Um, summing up the, the results of this operation, we estimate that the attackers have been able to delay the nuclear program in Iran for around about two years. There are obviously zero fatalities, and uh, the development cost has been estimated by us for to be roughly about $10 million. Now, important thing here is to understand our plan B, or your plan B. I mean, I'm not a military person, but obviously there was a plan B, there probably still is, and this would mean to, to delay the Iranian nuclear program by an airstrike. Uh, unfortunately, you, you can't just fire, let's say, two or three cruise missiles, because as you all will know, uh, these centrifuges are buried 75 feet underground, so it, it's a very hard target, and you would actually have to use bunker, bunker busters. Um, if you would have done that, there are military scenarios in, in, uh, in, in respect to this who estimate that if you would have do this, if you would have done this, you would probably delay the Iranian nuclear program by, by two to three years. Um, you would see many thousand casualties, and it would have cost you many billion dollars. Why so many casualties? Yeah, that, that's easy, so certainly Iran would retaliate using conventional force. Uh, you got troops in, uh, US troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. Israel is within striking distance, and so the whole Middle East uh, could, would probably have been in flames. Um, so, um, let, let's get back here for a second. If you just look at this, you will certainly understand easily that this type of warfare will not go away. It's a tremendous success. So, uh, the attackers have been able to achieve what was planned years ago, for example, by Israel in 2008, they did a rehearsal for, for a bombing run um, that was planned to, to take down the site by an, via an airstrike. They, they have been able to achieve almost the same result, but at a fraction of the cost and with zero fatalities. That's really fantastic in a way. 
And, and in, 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 a, in another way, you could probably even say, well, Iran shouldn't be uh, irate about the United States or Israel. They should say, thank you, because you killed nobody. <laughs> Okay, that, that was just a bit of humor here, but uh, just to, um, the, what I would like to point out is how this type of warfare really changes the landscape and that it will not go away. It was so successful that we are going to see more of, of, of the same type. The big problem, or I, I, I would have just argued in a, in a way, you could say, yeah, this, is, uh, this was highly successful, this is a good thing to do. No, I, that, that's not my point. The big problem that we have, as good and, and intelligent as it might sound, is proliferation. The proliferation of cyber weapon technology cannot be controlled for one very simple reason. When you think about nuclear weapons, what, what a um, proliferant needs is, in a nutshell, the know-how to do it, and then he needs the fissile material. And for counter-proliferation, your only chance to do anything is in, res in respect to the production and the distribution of the fissile material. You can't do anything about the spreading of know-how. So if you're an engineer and you do some research, you, you're going to be able to design and develop and, and produce your own nuclear weapon if you had fissile material. So all counter-proliferation is affecting uh, the development and the production and um, distribution of fissile material. Now let's look how this looks like in, in, in respect to cyber weapons. You also need know-how, but you don't need fissile material, you only need bits and bytes. And you can't control the proliferation of bits and bytes. That's impossible. So, um, my estimate is that, that we are going to see this aggressive technology spreading over the next couple of years. Um, this is going to spread not only to the usual suspects, such as China and Russia, they have it anyway already. Uh, this is also going to spread to rogue nation states and, uh, for example, to cyber terrorists or, or terrorists attempting to do cyber attacks and to organize crime. The drivers for this development, as I see it, are that, cyber, uh, that a cyber weapon and the technology that, that is required to, to use these weapons can be copied and modified easily. So if you have ever read or heard, yeah, something like Stuxnet is not, well, we, we won't see something like that in the next couple of years because it's so difficult. That's simply not true. It was extremely difficult to build the first weapon of this kind, but it is very easy to copy it. Just it's similar to nuclear weapons. So to design the first nuclear bomb, it required a genius like Oppenheimer and, and the resources of the Manhattan Project. But to copy that, it requires an average engineer. And as I have tried to explain before, there are even parts in Stuxnet that are generic. So if you spend enough time and, and you're proficient with control systems, you can simply copy and paste that into your own um, cyber weapon. Counter-proliferation is just not possible. It, it won't work. And uh, these weapons are very cheap, and I'm, I bet that a gray market will emerge. So, for example, when we think about rogue nation states and terrorists, uh, they don't need to um, develop the capability to design these weapons on their own. They just need buying power. And since these weapons are cheap, probably presently in, in the area of, of several million dollars, this might happen very soon. Um, I think that we, we are going to see a cyber weapon industry. Um, the, 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 the development cost is extremely low in mili military terms. Um, the production cost is zero. So if, if you want, let's say, uh, you want to create 10 or 50 samples, uh, it doesn't cost you a significant amount of money. And worldwide shipping is possible the same day. 
uh, via the internet. It's not a problem. So, for example, you could have an international team uh, with team members being located on different parts of, in different parts of the world, and they can still collaborate and they can ship the final product to to the highest bidder, let's say, within minutes. Um, my bottom line is that cyber weapon development will not go away. This, this is going to blossom just because it was so tremendously successful that deterrence will not work and that real defense is absolutely necessary. Real defense is, by the way, is quite easy because if you remember, yeah, we got zero protection on these systems and to go from zero to something is quite easy. So don't discuss, please, please, that's my pledge for, for all of you military guys, don't discuss the deterrence so much, it won't work. Just do discuss real protection. Thank you very much. Mr. Langer, Daniel Bellar, Siege Technology. I have uh, two questions. Uh, number one, uh, when I saw this at first, when I read this, uh, I had a sense of déjà vu in the sense of the security controls that you could use. You and others have suggested for this type of code injection attack to have signed code, um, signed digital signed, uh, you know, code. The thing is, uh, we have in the Windows world. Uh, I don't know very much about the Step Seven code. The uh, something called return-oriented programming attacks, in essence, control flow. Uh, diversion attacks. Do you, uh, I don't know very much about the operating system or whatever passes as an operating system. Do you think those type of uh, code inject, uh, those type of control flow attacks are possible? The second question is, uh, do you think there's, there is possible to do a merger between the MO of um, the configure, uh, the configure model, which is in essence a binary uh, signed distribution platform, uh, distribution platform for signed and hashed binaries? You yourself alluded to this uh, with the generic parts of the attacks. Okay, first of all, a, a controller, as it was used in this attack, is extremely simple compared to your notebook that you're carrying. It's, it's a single tasking operating system. Actually, it's, it's an embedded system. And as I said, you, you don't have anything like antivirus software running on, on these controllers. It, it just isn't possible. They are not designed to do this, these products. So a major type of defense, of protection, would be, as you said, digitally signed code, which is actually quite easy because you don't have to, to check the signature at runtime. This, this would not be possible, but you can check it at configuration time. And, and this is one of the um, recommendations that we have put out to the industry and uh, to the general public to demand from your vendors products that support digitally signed code. And if I got your other question right, uh, th this is about um, penetration testing frameworks and, and putting um, uh, raw code like, like these and exploits like these into penetration testing frameworks. If, if this was your question, yes, this is possible and this is what we expect to see in the near future. We have already issued alerts on our website. We, we, um, recommend any asset owner uh, from the military to uh, the operator of, of a cookie plant uh, to make sure uh, that uh, they're protecting their systems um, against threats like these because once that attack parts like this are in exploit tools or penetration testing frameworks then all bets are off because then any idiot can just assemble his or her cyber weapon attacking, well, who knows, probably uh, a power plant or probably just an automotive factory. You know that these guys really don't care that much about their targets. It's, it's just to, to, to make some, some impact and uh, to get bragging rights. And, and this is also important to understand in respect to the impact that, that we might see, that even though Stuxnet was highly targeted, this has much to do with the way 
the dropper was designed, this specific dropper. So if I use another dropper, just like a conventional worm, I can spread my weapon deliberately to as many targets that I can reach. And a serious attacker uh, would probably do this uh, uh, time-based, so he would set a timer so that, that uh, the attack sequence executes, for example, um, on, on Independence Day 12 noon. And then suddenly all infected systems are disrupted or you will probably see uh, power outages and stuff like that. Okay, uh, you answered my second question. I want to phrase the first one. Can you make the good digitally signed code perform malicious computations by control flow attacks? This is a technique that was pioneered in 97, uh, Solar Designer. It's called return oriented programming. It vitiates the security controls that, uh, for instance, like uh, signed code, because you don't inject any more foreign code. You, you would divert your control flow in such a way that uh, you are, it performs malicious computations. Meaning, and this depends, of course, how uh, the, the setup of this type of step seven code, if that is possible. Yeah. Well, I think it would be possible, but then on the other hand, it would probably be a little bit overreaching. It, uh, this, because you don't actually, as I said right now, we are at zero. So we don't even have authentication when, you want, when, when you're accessing controllers like these. And uh, so it would help really a lot to have some kind of, of, uh, of code integrity uh, mechanism that we can deploy very shortly on as many uh, targets as possible. That's our major concern right now. That we are, right now we, we are in a, in a window of vulnerability. So the race is open right now. The, the, the exploit code is in the wild, okay? Um, I bet that there are many researchers and people of all other flavors wearing any type of hats, with any head color, are in the process of analyzing and reproducing this code and, and uh, are uh, trying to, um, uh, to, uh, to build similar weapons. Now, the, the, the big question is, when will they succeed? They, they will succeed at some point in time. And as I said, if, if this goes into exploit tools, then all bets are off. And this is our major concern, to get as many uh, potential targets as possible secured in, in a decent manner. You can't do rocket science, for example, in a power plant. Or let's, let's take it a little bit further into a nuclear power plant. These uh, environments are regulated. So just to give you an idea, in, in a nuclear power plant, every instrumentation and control system that you intend to put in there must be proven. That means it must be old. This is one reason why you find uh, system operating systems like Windows NT there, because the regulators don't allow you to install Windows 7. This is how it works. And so it, it, it's a practical problem. So my, my urge is uh, don't think about rocket science in terms of protection right now. We are starting at zero, and our problem is that, that we have to get to, let's say, 50 or 60 in a matter of months. <clears throat> from FSecure. Thanks, Ralph. Great talk. I have one comment and one question. Um, first, a comment about, just to highlight what you mentioned about the availability of Stuxnet or samples of Stuxnet. Um, I tried this myself, I think, two months ago. I tried to find a copy of a Stuxnet binary from open sources, and it took me less than five minutes to find it, so it's, it's not really hard at all. But my real question is actually to ask about your opinion. Um, what do you think? Are there people related to the creation of Stuxnet in this room right now? <laughs> um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't know the audience, so I, I don't know where you're recruited from. Uh, as I said, I, I just arrived <clears throat> yesterday evening, and uh, I haven't been able to actually figure it out. But, but to, to give, probably give you, give you some more detailed answer, my theory is that 
you, you all know that, that I said in public, I put it on the record, yeah, the, the United States is the major force behind this. But my theory is, and probably some of you can, want to comment on this, that the U.S. military, the DOD, the Pentagon, was not. This, I would be surprised to learn that. But for, to me, this looks more like uh, a job of the intelligence organization. So, for example, it's a known fact that counterproliferation in, in respect to the Iranian nuclear program has been done for decades by the CIA. And also, um, Department of Energy is involved. So, uh, do we have anybody here from CIA? <laughs> Okay, that, that was a joke. And, and probably also not, not from, from DOE, but the, the, so that would be my, my theory where, where to look if, if you want to really nail it down. Okay. Uh, do you believe that the same attack could be pulled off uh, again? Didn't Iran got their lesson already? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Just uh, let's, let's look at some very basic factors here. As you will remember, our estimate is Time gained two years. The attack was started two years ago. So the effect is fading out. This raises a very interesting question. What's coming next? Uh, we have three options. Either we let Iran go forward with, this, with its nuclear program, which I don't see very likely, or we send the B-2s dropping bunker busters, or we send Stuxnet 2.0. For me, sending a new virus makes the most sense. So my theory is that, yeah, uh, the United, Sta United States is, right now is at cyber war, but on the offensive side. And um, they are probably just in the process of launching the next cyber weapon. So I, I would, be extremely surprised if within this year we don't see anything new of this type. And some people have speculated or, or commented that, yeah, you know, but now Iran has gotten a clue of what's going on and they can protect better, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, actually, th this is in a way a little bit naive because this also applies to the attackers. So uh, the attackers have also been able to learn from the experience. Uh, they uh, will certainly have analyzed what, what went wrong. Uh, they will certainly um, have upgraded their, um, uh, their uh, strategies. And uh, one other thing, now that Iran knows that they are under attack, it's, it's um, not required any longer to do the attack that stealthy. So I can just do some more overt, aggressive stuff, just try to hit hard, as hard as I can, and they, they know they're under attack anyway. It's going to be interesting this year. Uh, I have a question which is more, let's say, um, maybe from policy and legal side. Um, if we have now the stage in a warfare where um, the targets are civilian uh, infrastructure objects, then the first question comes to mind that uh, uh, in case the, tar the attacks can be totally stealthy and attribution is very hard to do, then this is inviting more and more actors to attack whatever civilian objects. Yes. Um, as we know, um, we have some laws already existing that would uh, limit uh, the use of armed forces and weapons towards the civilian infrastructure and civilians. Uh, international humanitarian law and law of armed conflict. Uh, these laws are um, now, there is a consensus, let's say, emerging that these laws are now already applicable in cyberspace as well. The question here is that uh, according to those laws, in order to do the attack or before the attack, you have to consider the secondary and tertiary effects on civilian population when you carry out operations. So, um, how would you comment it from technical side? Is it possible uh, for those guys who actually um, develop those methods and tools uh, for infrastructure exploits to consider the secondary and tertiary effects on the civilian population? Is it possible or how is it possible? Sure it is possible. It is easy. 
And, and don't think that, that you would uh, require a superpower like the United States to do something like that. This, is, this has also to do with, with deterrence. I could pull off an attack against a, a power plant, for example. I don't do it, I promise. But, but somebody like me could do it. And so what, what is your deterrence worth? I mean, uh, I, I have heard in, in the media that, that the United States is threatening potential um, uh, attackers and, and we will throw a bomb down your smokestack. And where would that be? I mean, in, in Germany or if I'm traveling in Switzerland or, or if I'm just taking uh, uh, time out in Hawaii, where, where would you hit me? I mean, that, that's in, in a way that that's not realistic. You really got to do defense properly. We have slept about a decade on this issue. And now it boils down to, to um, making good for, for this lost decade. It should have been done a decade ago, but it hasn't because everybody was under the assumption nothing has happened so far. So probably it won't happen in the future. That's nonsense. And uh, the real defense, real protection is possible and it is easy. And it costs a fraction of what a military retaliation strike would cost you, not, not to speak about fatalities. Uh, Niels Groenveld, I had a question. Is, isn't uh, deterrence something else than retaliation and is uh, improving the protection of the systems? not a form of pre uh, pre uh, preventive deterrence? Yeah, well, probably you, you military guys know that better than I do. I, I just want, want to make one point here. If you rely on deterrence, you're actually accepting the, pro the possibility that your systems are going to be attacked. And from my point of view, this is nonsense. You don't have to. If, you, if you're doing this, you're admitting, yeah, we slept the last decade and, and we really don't want uh, to, to uh, repair what needed to be repaired a couple of years ago, so we are relying on deterrence. And again, if your opponent is a non-state actor, what would your military, conventional military deterrence look like? You want to, uh, let's say, for example, retaliate against uh, or, or deter against a terrorist organization like Al-Qaeda? You remember how long it took to, to get a hold of bin Laden. So for me, this, this just doesn't make sense. Thomas Wiener, Bank. What do you think, uh, will we have some sort of power shift in terms that uh, less technologically advanced countries would be able to attack more technologically advanced because they are better targets. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, you got to understand that um, in, in the Middle East, for example, or in Africa, you only got a handful of targets that, that you could attack using this weapon technology. It is, is extremely difficult to find interesting targets there. Um, in the United States or in Europe, you find thousands of targets. So actually, we, we are much more threatened by, by this type of weapon technology uh, than anybody else. Next question. Uh, just a comment. This is Dimitri Parrish from McAfee. So I want to thank you for your comment about deterrence. I encourage everyone to stick around after the break for my talk. We're going to explain exactly how deterrence can work. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Chris Velbeck, EPP. Um, it would be nice if you could elaborate a bit on uh, smart grid security, um, just um, if you think that this is becoming the, the future threat, and et cetera. Yeah, smart grid only makes matters worse because the smart grid is much more complex than your old style, old style power network or power grid. And from my point of view, it is probably not a very good idea to make a system more complex that we are unable to defend properly the, the way it is, the old style. So uh, one, one last comment about this. 
most of the problems in, in relation to lacking security or um, fragility in, in the control system sector are related to system complexity and that the designers and operators and the people who maintain these systems don't understand the system no longer. And you can't secure what you don't understand. If you add another level or layer of, of complexity to the system, you're going to get lost very soon. Okay, thank you very much.